able uh, to be with us, they will have an opportunity to uh, hear us at a later date. So I believe we are recording. A few things uh, before we get started. Let me see here. Hopefully everybody can um, see our agenda for today. These will kind of be the um, big topics that we're gonna try to cover today. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, the role of the paraprofessional. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, the importance of that strong and effective instructional team. Uh, the basics of special education. We'll spend some time talking about confidentiality um, and those um, next steps. And what I'll do, I'm going to pull up our shared folder. And I'm not quite sure, um, for, for most of you, I would have to think, um, that navigating Zoom is um, just kind of a natural thing that we've all learned to do in the life of COVID. Um, but this very last handout in our shared folder um, has Zoom instructions. So if you're not quite sure um, how to navigate the screen, um, there is information on um, the use of Zoom. Um, and then all of our handouts are kind of ordered here. Um, you will find the agenda. Of course, our PowerPoint, uh, we'll have some activities that we're gonna try to do um, and then we'll refer to these forms. Um, and then um, throughout uh, today's presentation, um, if you're not able to access uh, the direct link, especially if you're sitting in a group, um, we will uh, try to pull those up as, as we move along today. But just wanted to orient you to those. Um, those were all in the shared link. Anybody not able to uh, find the forms, the handouts for today? You can drop a message in the chat. Okay. Um, so Ohio's Partnership for Excellence in uh, Paraprofessional Preparation, which we refer to as OPEP, um, they've really um, provided us with a lot of guidance, tools, a bunch of different resources to really help support districts as well as paraprofessionals across our state. So we're very fortunate to have uh, this group to kind of help guide uh, some of the work that um, we will be doing across the uh, four days that we're together. Um, and I realize not all of you will be able necessarily to participate in all four sessions, um, but we are going to be using um, a guidance document that they have shared um, called Improving Results for All Children. Um, and then we'll be pulling in um, some other uh, resources to kind of support our time together. Um, I guess one of the things that Tiffany and I are, are so excited about is really just the diversity that you will bring to our conversations and to the sessions, um, because we could quickly tell just even based on who has registered, um, just the different locations that you're coming from. Uh, we have some people who are definitely outside of our SST region, so we welcome you as well. Uh, and so glad that you're here. Um, and just the uh, number of years of experience that you that you bring to the table, as well as all the different grade levels that you represent. Um, so um, we are very excited about that. Um, another uh, thing I think that we wanna mention is um, we know that the roles that you all have in your districts, in your programs, in your preschool programs, in your boards of DD, um, they probably all don't look the same, right? They look very different. So um, as we discuss um, you know, the role of a parapro, we, we know that we're really uh, speaking to a very uh, wide range of individuals. We do also wanna say that if um, along the way um, you're having conversations, um, you hear some of the information that we're presenting today, 
If there's any questions, concerns that you have, maybe things that feel a little bit differently than what you're experiencing, please go back and have conversations with your special ed director, your supervisor, um, so that you can have some more conversations about some of the information that we've, we're sharing with you today. Um, you are more than welcome to share the PowerPoints, the handouts, anything uh, that, that we're providing you today. And one of the things that will happen following today is we will be um, sharing all of the links uh, to the recordings as well as the handouts to our uh, regional special ed directors, as well as our preschool supervisors, uh, for anyone who did not have an opportunity to participate today. So um, all of that information will go back out um, to the region regardless. But thinking about the role of the paraprofessional, um, you know, it's related uh, specifically to the role of the teacher. Uh, so in fact, you know, when we think about the roles of the teacher and the paraprofessional, they really should complement each other, right? Um, together, uh, we're forming this instructional team to really meet the individual needs of all of the students that we encounter, right? Um, paraprofessionals um, assist and support teachers and students, you know, without you, you know, trying to think about how we would um, keep things moving and, and operating in our programs, um, the work that you do is priceless. So um, really thinking about the importance of a strong, effective instructional team um, is really becoming increasingly clear as we think about um, the new challenges that we're faced with in all of our classrooms. So um, we um, totally appreciate all that you do uh, in your districts, in your programs. So um, we're gonna do um, an activity. Um, and I think most of you, um, if you haven't already been uh, combing through some of our um, support resources and documents, but we're gonna pull up a form almost kind of like just to kind of get us started and get our feet wet our feet wet in terms of uh, thinking about our roles. And when you take a look at this um, sheet, what we want you to do is, is to really think about all of these individual tasks. Um, would it be something that only a teacher would be performing or perhaps um, a paraprofessional or is it a shared responsibility? And so um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And again, this is a handout that is actually um, in your shared folder. So when we look at these individual tasks, I want you to think about if it's, if it's the role of the teacher, you can either record this on the handout that you um, were able to access, or if you just have a piece of paper close by, um, that will work as well. You could also drop um, a, your response in the chat. Um, so use a T for teacher, a P for parapro, or an S for shared. You could also use any of the annotation features and um, kind of put a response uh, directly on, um, on the screen um, using your, um, your feature of choice. But I'm going to go through uh, these and if you will kind of think to yourself or like I said, you're more than welcome to put it in the chat um, or uh, use the annot annotation feature. But in terms of um, recording and charting data, who do you think um, is responsible for that task? Administering standardized tests. And I see people already putting things in the chat. Thanks, Jamie. How about scoring standardized tests? Grading tests and papers. Oh, thanks, Valerie. Analyzing and interpreting the results of various assessment activities. And I know I'm kind of going fast through these. We're going to refer back to these as we kind of move along in the presentation. So 
just know that as you're writing these down, we'll kind of revisit these. How about setting goals and objectives for the class and individual students? I see a, a T and an S. Planning lessons. We see a T and an S. Uh, introducing new skills and concepts. See a T. How about modifying and adapting instructional plans? Taylor says a T. Uh, carrying out lesson plans. See some S's. How about instructing individual or small groups of students? See an S for shared. I see a couple different responses. Um, how about developing behavior management plans? Teachers, how about implementing behavior management programs? Disciplining students. We'll both. Okay, so some shared. Developing instructional materials. I see a T. How about preparing instructional materials? The yeah, combination. Um, how about evaluating student performance and progress? See some shareds. Um, conducting training in community learning sites. Okay. Um, recording attendance and maintaining other records. See teacher, I see shared. How about setting up and maintaining learning centers um, or adaptive equipment? Okay. Uh, taking inventory and ordering supplies. About meeting and conferring with parents. So teacher shared. Um, consulting with professional staff about students' program and behaviors. Yes. Okay. T. Um, and then how about maintaining a clean, safe, and learning environment? All right, so as you can quickly see, there's been like a different range of responses, right? And I suspect that um, you'll kind of um, witness that as part of our conversations and when we give you opportunities to um, share within your um, breakout rooms and we do some small group um, conversations. So, um, you know, kind of as we referred to earlier that, you know, the role of the paraprofessional is related to the role of the teacher. Um, and we know the roles of the teacher and the parapro really should genuinely complement each other. Um, we're gonna see um, a next, the next series of slides um, that will actually, uh, delineate the differences of the role of the teacher and that of the paraprofessional, really helping us to kind of demonstrate that complementary effect. Um, and um, what we're gonna do is we're going to attempt this, knowing that uh, some of you are sitting <laughs> in a small group um, at your um, district or program, but we're going to attempt to put you into some breakout rooms. Um, and what we want to do is um, assign you to a specific breakout room. For those of you who are sitting together, of course, you'll be, be your own uh, breakout room. I want you to look for the number of your breakout room when you receive the notice on your screen to join the breakout room. You'll notice a, a little pop-up screen that will have a number on it. 
Um, so your group number will be listed in the specific area that you will be thinking about and discussing in your breakout room. And I'm going to pull up the handout that we have uh, that will help you um, think about the specific area uh, that you're going to be um, discussing. What we want you to do is just jot down some notes from your small group uh, to possibly share out uh, during our larger group discussion as we kind of move through each of these areas um, as a smaller group. So what we want you to think about or what we want you to have some conversations around is what does this specific area look like in your current setting and role? And are there other ways that you work together in this area that might not be listed? So what I'm going to do is this is the actual form or handout in your shared folder that I'm referring to. And you can see the discussion questions at the top and each uh, specific um, area is listed on the um, left-hand side. So whoever's assigned to group one, you're gonna be talking about uh, setting and organization. For those in uh, assigned group two, you're gonna talk about assessments. Um, and then group three, objectives. Group four, instruction. Group five, positive behavior supports. Six would be um, working with parents. And group seven, you're gonna be targeting individualized planning. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm gonna give you a chance to kind of look at um, that particular area. And I'm gonna be uh, attempting to set up our breakout rooms. So bear with me here. And I'm going to pause our recording. Talking. We're just waiting for everybody to return from their breakout room. What is that? I must have the right screen. Leaving breakout. Room. Recording in progress. There you go. Here's our timer. If you're not muted. Please mute for us. Thank you. So I got us recording again. Um, so, like I said, if you're um, if you are not muted, if you would go ahead and mute. Um, but this is the the part where we're going to come back together, and um, if we have some brave souls who will. Um, want to talk about the specific areas, but we're going to kind of start with this setting and organizing. Let's see here. I think we can't hear. All right. So um, hopefully um, Lori, are you guys okay? Can you still hear me? I just muted somebody just because we were getting a little bit of um, background noise, but I don't want to make it so that you can't hear either. Sometimes if there are multiple people um, on a computer close together, then we get a bunch of feedback that might be an issue. Um, but how did we do for our very first breakout session? Did it go okay? Or um, I think there was a group that was maybe struggling just a little bit with technology. 
we thought we would give it a shot. This is our only breakout session for um, today. So um, as we move along, we'll be mindful of um, those technical difficulties, but let's, let's think about this setting and organization and um, considering the role of the teacher um, as well as the paraprofessional uh, role. You know, um, when we think about the role of the teacher, um, we think about, you know, planning the weekly schedule, uh, the lessons, and thinking about all of those different activities um, for our classrooms and modifying for individual students, um, making sure that um, everyone on the team has um, records available. Um, oh, thank you so much for those of you putting in the chat that um, it went good, perfect. Um, and then um, also thinking about the teacher communicating uh, student needs um, and relevant details that um, when we think about their safety and well being. And for parapros, um, thinking about um, you, know, you being those individuals who really are boots to the ground implementing those plans um, under the direction and guidance of our teacher. Um, you know, with the appropriate amount of training, uh, making those modifications, um, and again, uh, with the approval from our teachers, and then uh, keeping progress records for um, our students on a daily basis. I'm curious, um, somebody from room uh, one or whoever targeted this particular area, any thoughts or um, conversations or things that really resonated with you as you were in your breakout session, you can unmute, you can throw it in the chat. Anybody wanna highlight their, their discussions? And Deb just told me she has lost her sound, okay. So I'll go ahead and look. Okay. Um, so for those of you who, and really anybody could unmute, not necessarily the um, who was in uh, room one, but any reactions as you see um, kind of these points around um, the environment or setting and organization, any reactions? or maybe even thinking about how you scored yourself uh, when we did that very first opening activity when it came to uh, the planning um, or you know implementing those plans. Any reactions? No? This is a quiet group. <laughs> I, I would love to hear anybody's um, conversation around this area. Oh, I do have a question. Okay. Um, on that beginning activity, there were some shared. So I'm looking at your slide right there to where it's actually like, this is the teacher's role. This is the pair of pros role. Uh -huh. Are there anything there that could be shared? Like I'm looking at uh, plans, lessons, and activities, and I can I can see a teacher with the pair of pro joining and, and, and kind of sharing and, and putting some ideas together. I can see that happening. Yeah, so you're exactly right. When we kind of wrap up with these kind of individual roles. Um, at the end, there will be a shared slide. Okay. And you're right. There are certain aspects when you think about a lot of these topics where it does make sense under the direction of the teacher um, that some of these things could be happening. And we wanted to be very careful um, at the beginning to, to make sure that we, you know, made a statement that we know um, some of these things might look a little bit different in your individual programs, right? 
Um, and so um, being being careful to, to really think about, um, you know, there are certain things that we know that should be under the direction of the teacher, but there are some things when we look at certain aspects um, that we could see some of those things being shared. Thank you. Sure. And Tiffany, I don't know if you wanted to chime in or if there was a thought you had. Yeah, I think um, it is going to look very different in every district. Uh, things are required of paras differently. Um, and I think our purpose here today was just kind of give you that foundation. Um, we know that it's going to look different. I know I was in district last year. I was a special ed director for the last 10 years. And even within my district, para roles look different from, say, a one-to-one um, aid to a one, you know, to a maybe classroom para or, um, you know, different things look different and they even can look different from building to building within a district. So I think um, what we were trying to do today is just give you the foundation and, and it definitely is some um, talking points, right? When you go back um, and having discussions with your teacher um, that you're assigned with, uh, you know, but again, this was just really, we know everything's going to look different in other districts, but we just, our hope was to just give some basic foundational um, information. And an, another thing that we want you to think about too is um, moving forward, we will really rely on um, your input, your feedback for when we plan the next sessions. We kind of have a good idea or understanding of what will um, be included in those next sessions, but things perhaps that you're needing more information on, um, we know that we're gonna continue to build on these four sessions and offer additional sessions. So things that we continue to hear or things that resonate with you, those will think, be things that we'll be mindful of moving forward. Um, and as um, Tiffany said, we knew that, gosh, even trying to come up with a starting point for this group, knowing how diverse you're- I would like to address the chat. Um, you know, Lori put in there that we mostly assist our teachers. They do all they want to, and they may tell us what they need. But then like in Joe's case, the teachers that I work often ask for my input when planning lessons and activities for the class. We truly are a team and we work really well together. That's awesome, Joe. Um, um, you know. it really, it really is, um, the, um, I've worked in the same building for, well, not the same building because we combined two schools, but I've worked in the same district with the same group of people for 14 years. And the, the role can actually be different from classroom to classroom. I've oh, worked yeah. with teachers who I've worked with teachers who literally didn't want me to do anything, but stand at the back of the room and not bother anything but I've been re that that's only happened once or twice I've been really lucky with the teachers that I work with they value and not just me but there are, we have several pair pair pros in our building and they value what we bring and and they ask for our input and they they want us to be a part of the planning process and everything so it's it's really a good environment to work in that's fantastic that I, um, I was a special ed teacher in a multi-handicap classroom for many, many years, and I could not have, and then I worked at an, e, you know, an ED classroom, um, and I could not have done my work day without my paras. Um, we were all on the same page. We had morning meetings, like we just gelled, and I couldn't do my job, and I'm sure the teachers that you all work with would probably tell tell us the same thing. They couldn't do their job without the support of the Paris. So I love it. Thanks for sharing, Joe. And relationships are key, right? When yes. you have really good working relationships, boy, what a difference. And when you talk about that whole idea of complementing each other, um, it only just benefits the student, right? So um, we know that relationships that you have with each other um, can either make or break, right? um, the, those services. So, um, yeah, thanks guys. Great input. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, 
something, Holly. Um, with um, the program that we currently have, I'm, you know, the director uh, this year. And so um, first time they've had like an on-site director. And um, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to um, be present in this um, class and also have um, one of the uh, instructional aids here also, um, because I'm going to look to restructuring um, all of that next year, um, because we have a separation. We have classroom aids, and then we have extended care aids. Well, we're all here for the same purpose, and that's our kiddos. So right. um, the ones that are in, in um, extended care don't get the benefit of being in the classroom and getting that camaraderie and that knowledge that you can gain like from um, your teacher. And then also knowing the children. Um, I was sitting here talking to Taylor and they don't have a clue who has an IEP or where these children are. So, you know, that can create behavior problems. So um, by looking at a different structuring plan um, for next year, some will be woohoo and some probably not so happy. So yeah. um, because it will be different, um, but I want everyone included um, in educating our kiddos and being a part of the families. So um, that's the way that that has to come about. So that's why I wanted her to be present with me. And then we will present it to um, the rest of the group and teachers. Um, and she'll be there to help present to her peers because sometimes things are a lot better coming from, you know, a peer versus the administrator and so forth. So, um, you know, I value the conversations that everybody's having. So that's you know, this whole teacher and paraprofessional role is something that I'm I'm very interested in and and wanting to move forward because we are doing nothing like that, mm-hmm. you know, um, in a building. Now, maybe in the classroom, but not as, you know, specific as this, but I need to get it all meshed together. Thanks, Janet. Our um, building, our building culture is literally that every adult in that building is a teacher in some way. It doesn't matter whether you are a cook, a custodian, an aide, a secretary, admin, a teacher, we are all a teacher in some way for these students, whether it be behavior. And everybody in the building is, is the, just the culture is, it's we're friendly, we're a family and we treat each other that way. And the kids see that and it, you know, it goes towards them too. They, they see the adults acting that way and they, they're toward, they, they're with each other that way as well. So it's, it's a, it's a good place to work. (laughs) You're giving me shivers. I want to come work where you work, right? (laughs) Um, Sometimes I do think in certain situations, we um, underutilize our paraprofessionals. And uh, when we think about um, all of the different aspects um, to that instructional team, um, you know, just really wanting to make sure that we're um, utilizing our paraprofessionals as, um, you know, as much as we can. So thank you all. Gosh. Good conversations. I am going to go on to the next um, section here or area. And this was all around assessments. So um, thinking about the teacher's role of assessing students, administering those tests, grades, and then the interpretation piece, and then our paraprofessionals role in terms of monitoring um, reporting uh, results and thinking about the, that observation piece. Anybody have um, a comment, a reaction to the assessments? From group two, we did have conversation about administering the tests. Okay. Because in some aspects, um, our parents are doing that. Uh, Is that, in your opinion, is that like always a no-no? Were there some gray areas there? Well, so I would be curious, what kind of tests? Well, for us, go ahead. For us, it's like spelling tests. If they're not, if they're absent, we're doing spelling tests. We're getting on iPads and they have math tests on there. Things like that 
that the teacher doesn't have a lot of time to sit down with those kids. So I'm doing that. Like I'm giving spelling tests. I'm doing iPad tests because she's asking. Yeah, and, and certainly I think about the, the direction of the teacher. Probably one of the things that would be a red flag if I would have a red flag would be around maybe some of those high stake tests that we think about. Um, and Tiffany, I don't know if you want to chime in here, but that would be more of a red flag for me in terms of, you know, when we think about the state tests and all of those, um, you know, some of the security kinds of things that you run into. So you would say administering a test as long as it was with the guidance of the teacher, through the guidance of the teacher would still be okay. And it wasn't something that you were administering all of the time. Um, you know, that was something that was agreed upon, you know, when we think about um, individualized supports. And I don't know, Tiffany, if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if it's a spelling test because the child was absent or, um, you know, to piggyback on what Holly said, as far as those high stakes, so it'd be those anytime that that teacher is going for, um, you know, testing that for achievement, whether it's the state test or summative or formative, that really should be kind of in her realm um, or his realm as the teacher. Um, I know in my district previously, I didn't, you know, as the director, I didn't mind if a spelling test was given or they were working on sight words or math facts or, um, but it's more when we're going for what do they know, right? And we're using that information um, in that IEP. And we're going to talk about the IEP here in a little bit, um, which we all know the IEP is a legal document. So again, just making sure um, you are protected as a paraprofessional, the district, your teacher, um, and I think whenever in doubt, ask, right? So go to your immediate supervisor and say, hey, should I be doing this or should I not be doing this? Um, and just have some dialogue is my suggestion. Because there's been times where I would get approached like, am I really, should I be doing that? And then really, no, you shouldn't, you know, <laughs> depending on what it is. And then I go have a conversation with the teacher because sometimes um, that is a sign that maybe that teacher needs more support, right? Um, and looking at her day and where we can best use our paras. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. Thank you. Jen welcome. Jennifer put a nice um, blurb in the chat about, um, you know, taking um, a student one-on-one -on -one if uh, they aren't there the day of the test uh, into another room. Uh, their board approved to administer um, certain uh, tests. Um, we are not allowed to discuss tests with them, just more making sure they are staying on um, task, I think is what that is referring to. So do you go through, Jennifer, do you go through the, the state, the training to be um, an administrator? Because the rules are pretty clear in the um, testing manual as far as state tests go. Yeah, so last year, so my name's really Mary. Jennifer just has us all logged in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, Mary. That's okay. But yeah, last year I had to go on and get approved by the state, I assume is who it was through. I got a certificate that said that I could administer um, the state test. And then I've also sat in on map tests. But again, like we can't necessarily talk to them. It's just more to make sure that they are not up wandering around the room or, you know, doing the test, not going too fast, just if they have a, if they aren't good at test taking, I guess, like in the classroom to where it would be a distraction. Um, I know like my one-on-one -on -one this year makes a lot of sounds and so it's distracting for the other students as well, so. Thank you for that. Valerie's put in some information in the chat about how she supports um, students. Um, and kind of going back to Tiffany's um, earlier comment about really that IEP um, really outlining for our students who um, are on an IEP outlining, you know, what that support looks like in testing situations and 
um, what is allowed to be provided depending upon the test that's given. So uh, thank you, Valerie, for um, including that, you know, and even thinking about the, the read aloud, you know, there's all kinds of guidance around when students are allowed and not allowed to have a read aloud based on what's listed in their IEP. So we appreciate you putting that in there. Anything else around assessments? So objectives, um, here we're really thinking about those individualized um, learning objectives that we would have for students. So thinking about the teacher's role of really determining what would be appropriate for individual students, um, thinking about um, input from our other team members, and then looking at the para's role, um, you know, really providing that um, input um, or contributing input to some of those objectives um, by providing some of those um, updates um, for uh, student progress. We know that you're spending, you know, lots of time with that student and, you know, oftentimes you have daily input. Um, and then implementing uh, teacher provided lessons to meet identified objectives. Again, not necessarily teaching new content, but you're under the direction of um, the teacher. So I'm curious, what, what resonated with you in this particular area or any, any reactions to the objectives? I'm curious about um, providing updates on student progress. What does that look like? Like, do you update your teacher that you assist on daily progress, weekly progress? Um, I'm curious too, Holly, how that kind of looks. I know it looks different yeah. even from one-to-one to, -one to classroom. Um, are you using any kind of forms or checklists or notebooks or data collection? Okay. This is Danielle at Malvern Elementary. Um, I'm the principal, but I am sitting with two paraprofessionals and yeah. they both share that they, they do daily progress, daily updates, but they really are a part of the classroom. Um, kind of, we're very fortunate. We have an amazing paraprofessional um, team here, as well as intervention specialists and classroom teachers. It's really very seamless. It, we're very, very blessed. So I feel like everybody takes a very active role in helping our, our kids here. That's great. Thanks, Danielle. Thank Appreciate you. your input. Yeah, so Hopewell School indicates uh, roles are pretty much what we do. IEPs on our ready list uh, to help implement daily. Good input, guys. We appreciate that. Anybody else? All right. Did I go too fast? Did somebody else have a response? All right, how about instruction? So the teacher is providing that instruction for the entire group, uh, sometimes in small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. And then for our paraprofessionals, um, supporting that instruction um, of small groups and individuals, and then really thinking about that piece of just reinforcing uh, the teacher's instruction. Um, any thoughts or reaction? I work a lot with small groups. I'm, I'm a gen ed para. I mean, we have some students with um, IEPs in the classroom, but uh, I, I help the, I help them. But then I also run small groups in kindergarten, first and second grade, and um, we, uh, the teachers will give us a general overview of what they want us to cover. You know, like second grade, we're we're working on fluency now, so we put together binders. 
with uh, different things to do. And I've just got, I actually just finished putting those together for myself and two other pairs that also help with the, the fluency um, with the second grade intervention groups. But um, mostly uh, the teachers are pretty good about giving us the lesson and this is what we want you to do. Sometimes we'll, I'll, I'll come to my teacher and say, hey, I found this, is it okay to use this with with this group or with this group or whatever. And, and um, they'll look over it and we do that as well. Um, in the mornings with my second graders, uh, if there's a concept that they've done the day before that they don't quite, haven't quite grasped or even, you know, from previously, I do a lot of reteach first thing in the mornings. We'll, that we'll find um, worksheets that we can work on or like with math, I will pull out the manipulatives and start, you know, going over things. Right now I've got a, we have a new student who, uh, still struggling with odd and even. So I've been pulling him for the last week and uh, we're finally starting to get it. But so we just a uh, little bit, a lot of reteach and, and those types of, of situations. So. Awesome. Great. So it sounds like you're providing a lot of that additional support. I'm in a class there. I'm in the elementary school. We do K to two and we're in a special ed class. So there's two to three kids per aid and teacher per adult. Let's say that because there's one teacher, three aides. Um, the teacher does her lessons and we just normally assist with whichever child needs the help at the time. And sometimes we'll break into small groups and we'll have our own kids doing our own small group, but still that was pre-planned by the teacher. We just, mm -hmm. you know, talk to the kids about it, make sure they follow through. So what you have down for number four instruction is pretty accurate in our classroom. Awesome, thanks Katie. Anybody else? Looks like Hopewell put another comment. We share all those roles in case the teacher needs to be, sorry, um, pulled away. They initiate the group. So again, it's under the direction of the, the teacher. Valerie indicates when my student or any others need extra help with things, I will pull them out of class and give them extra help. Uh, usually I uh, just help the teacher in the class as needed. Great. Awesome. So we wondered at this point, would it be worth taking a stretch break, like a real quick stretch break of like maybe three to five minutes? Or would you like us to continue? Just put it. Oh, keep going. We're good. Okay. Good? All right. We're, we'll keep moving along. Okay. So the next section is all around positive behavior interventions and supports. So thinking about our uh, role of the teacher, um, you know, making those plans for all of those behavioral supports, whether we're thinking about groups of children or uh, individual children. And then the paraprofessional's role, um, thinking about implementing those uh, specific strategies around behavior, uh, using the same techniques that the teacher's using, um, and then helping to determine appropriate strategies based on daily contact with students. So um, any and thoughts? I would like to put in here too, um, when I, we were looking at this, you know, with all things behavior, right? Um, when things would kind of go south for me, I was um, in an ED classroom as the lead. And when we would get hung up would be if um, my pair and I were not on the same page, right? So I think the behavior plan is getting, you know, implemented and followed, but then they go out um, and maybe something comes up and, and there's a strategy change and I don't necessarily as the teacher know about it and and the kid you know the student could just sniff that out in a heartbeat right like mom and dad um, and so I'm interested to hear um, when, when I we were putting this together I'm like I want to hear um, if we have any first of all if we have any um, pairs out there working with our behavior students and how does that look 
So I was, hi, I'm Holly, I'm Jamie. I was in group five. Um, a little bit of my background is I worked in a special needs school for 15 years and I just moved to a regular ed uh, school, which is now, it's called Indian Creek and I am put in with a mixture of students. Um, and we were talking about positive behavior support and in the group I had, we had a lady that was working K to two and I'm middle school. And then we had a woman working with an adult student. Um, so we got like a big mixture of age range, uh, but it seems to be that a reward system in play um, for each student, whether it be a whole classroom reward system where each student seemed to help the most and to keep maybe like a data sheet, maybe a sticker sheet, maybe a written, um, whether it be a notebook home type of a deal or a written notebook with that you got you as the staff keep of each child, which I highly recommend. So everybody knows what's going on all the time. Um, and then fulfilling that reward to whatever, you know, you lay your class upon. And like um, she said that they did sometimes class parties at the end of the day or at the end of the week. Um, for the adult student, they did, he actually got paid to do his wage at school and also had positive reinforcements like high fives and such. Um, in my middle school range, we had them earn certain tokens, whether it's for behavior or turning in work. When they get so many tokens, which is 15, they're allowed to cash out and do 15 minutes of work on an Xbox. So they have to work to earn to play. So in um, the conversation, did you, so is that something that the paras and the teacher do together, like coming up with those strategies or, do you say to your teacher, hey, I think I have a strategy that might work. So what does, I guess I'm curious as how that communication between the teacher and the paraprofessional interact around behavior. Um, I love uh, all things, uh, reward systems and following through. Um, that is like the saving grace, right? Because if you don't follow through, we have yes. a lot on our hands. Especially with special needs children because yes. they need shelter. Yes. Absolutely. So um, I can't speak for them, but I know right now in my current situation, um, we talk, you know, so how do you think this worked? Did that work? Did this work? Um, so coming up with, he says, well, I have an Xbox, the teacher, I have an extra Xbox I can bring in and we could find a way for them to work for that. And that's, we ended up just talking it out and finding a way, uh, making it, you know, age appropriate middle school children, um, he has a, you know, real safe Xbox that has safe games. It's all locked up. We know exactly what they're playing, um, and who they're playing and they play it in front of us for 15 minutes. They get to earn that by Friday. So, um, you know, discussion. And if you have an aid that's not following through, then I feel like at that point, you're not working as a team and to fix that problem. Yep. Because, yeah, the kids will sniff that out. They will sniff it out if there's drama anywhere. <laughs> and yes. they'll play off Especially that. Especially middle schoolers. <laughs> oh, any, I, I mean, I've any worked kid, all, I've, worked, I've worked in every grade. So, yes, definitely any grade. These kids will smell it out and they'll look for a reason to, you know, put their little two cents into it as well. But even if they're nonverbal, they will, they will smell it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think too, if, um, as they get older, even our little ones, um, last year I had to cover half a year as the building principal and, um, at an elementary school and we had some kiddos at RTI and we had the whole reward system going on. And, um, but before we kind of started that whole process, I wanted to know he was a little third grader and I wanted to know what his currency was, what would he work for? Mm -hmm. And, and they'll tell you, they will tell you straight up. He would, he would work for Tootsie Rolls. He would work, <laughs> um, he would work for wiping tables in the cafeteria because he hated going to homeroom after lunch and recess. Um, and also kind of get, and he was a behavior child, you know, um, and so that physical activity in the cafeteria kind of brought him down after recess. Right. But he would sit there. He gave me a whole list. This is what I'll work for. And then I'd come up with an idea. Nope, I won't work for that. So sometimes just engaging the kids in that conversation piece. Yeah, I, I, everything's conversation. I And 
that goes from your staff to your kids. Like this is what's going. And if you're not going to work for it, we're going to have to find a different way. Absolutely. Great. Thanks for sharing. No lots, problem. Lots of good information in the chat as well. That whole issue of um, just being mindful of consistency was mentioned. Um, you know, Jennifer talked about um, their use or her use of reward systems um, and points, um, monetary rewards for jobs that are done. Um, awesome. Thanks, guys. Anybody else? All right, I think I'll keep us moving here. So working with parents, um, so thinking about the teacher's role, actually um, meeting with parents, thinking about those conferences uh, for planning and review, um, being able to communicate uh, students' uh, progress. And then for the paraprofessional, um, engaging in those reporting aspects to the parent on um, specific items, and they use the example here of uh, bus transportation. Um, and again, this is um, when we think about working with parents as directed by the teacher um, and then making sure that, you know, as we have those interactions that we're reporting back to the teacher. So i um, curious what, um, what reactions you had to this particular area. Well, this is Joe. Um, I had stated in our group that I've worked as um, a behavior pair. I've worked as a one-on-one. -on -one. I've been in um, special needs classes, and you know now I'm just in gen I'm in Gen Ed. But we, uh, my very first student that I worked with as her one one-on-one, -on -one, there was a a notebook that we passed back and forth every day. I'm the person I wrote I wrote in the notebook because I was with this student all day long. Um, but the teacher always looked at it. We talked about what we were what was going to be written in it, um, and she approved it before it, it went home. And it was a, a daily log back and forth. the The student's grandmother had custody, and she would um, she would let us know, hey, she had a rough morning getting ready, so things might be a little out of sorts first thing. And we would write, you know, I would write about the good things that happened that day and sometimes the not so good things that happened that day, but it was just a line of communication back and forth. And, um, but then there's other times that, you know, I, I don't like occasionally parents will see in the grocery store and they'll be like, hey, this happened, or they'll reach out through social media, hey, this happened. And I always, redirect them to the teacher for that one. I'm like, oh, I must not have been in the classroom when that happened, or I wasn't out at recess when that happened. And just, I redirect them to the teacher to discuss those those types of things because that's not my role. Hi, this is Mandy from Bel Air. Um, sorry, we can't get our video to work, but um, okay. going along the lines of what Joe just said, how they had a, a notebook or whatever that they communicated through, um, I do uh, the student drop off and pick up. So I guess the line of communi communication with the parents comes through me <laughs> and then I kind of relay it to whatever teachers I need to within the school. Yeah. The only thing I would say to caution you on, on the notebook, right? Um, that's a strategy I think we've all used is um, be very careful um, with, the tone of how we're writing in that notebook, right? Because sometimes, um, let's say if the child had a really bad day, right? From start to finish, bad day. Find something good, right? Um, to put into that notebook. So when mom and dad open it, they don't see all the negative of the day. That is the only thing I would caution you on with that notebook that travels back and forth is just keep it very neutral, keep emotion out of it. Um, and, and give the parent um, some good stuff, right? Some good things they did for the day. Um, otherwise, somebody is going to hear or get a phone call from the parent. Um, so just something to think, you know, to kind of keep in mind. 
I, yeah, there was always a positive. It was never a completely negative. And sometimes I had to reach really deep for that positive, <laughs> but we found it. Right? <laughs> right? No, totally understand that. Um, I, I love that point, though, Tiffany, about the tone of written communication, because I'm famous for this, too. Like if I'm in a hurry or I'm tired, maybe my email isn't as nice and flowery as it usually is conveying some of that warm fuzzy. Um, so, yeah, sometimes that the tone gets lost in our written communication if we're not careful. So and, and I think, too, sometimes parents, you know, like to hear from the teacher, right? A note home from the teacher. Not that they don't like hearing from the parents that are with their child most of the day. Um, but I've had parents comment, too, that it would be nice to have a blend, right? A blend of input from the teacher, input from the parents. Um, so they get a whole true picture of that day. Um, so just some suggestions there. <coughs> Good comments again in the chat about um, that use of the journal and um, making sure that we're reflecting those good things that happen. Um, Hopewell said that the roles look pretty consistent with what their practices are. Good. Julie, Julie talked about the notebooks as well. Um, and that the teacher's actually right in there as well. So perfect. All right. Um, this last one, individualized planning. So teacher's um, role, thinking about developing and directing the implementation of those individual plans um, and making sure that that gets communicated with all of our team members. And then the pairs role of um, carrying out those individual plans under the direction of the teacher, um, as well as participating, um, being an active member on those teams for our students, um, communicating those daily activities, um, any of those necessary changes, um, and then the needs of the students. So. Anybody want to chime in for um, the individualized planning? This is Malvern. We were in um, breakout room number seven, and we felt that this um, role was pretty reflective of what takes place here as well. Um, as I shared earlier, you know, we just have a phenomenal team. And so our teachers do a great job of including the paraprofessional um, at, at their comfort level and allowing them to take part in um, the roles with the students. So um, we really didn't have anything to add we felt this was very reflective, like I said, of what takes place here. Thank you for that, Danielle. You're welcome. Anybody else? So I'm going to take us to the very last slide. And this was the slide that we kind of um, mentioned right off the get-go about um, the individual roles, but then just this shared responsibility of some of those items. So when we think about recording and charting our data, um, carrying out those lesson plans, um, you know, all of these items being some of those shared roles and really thinking about some of the aspects, um, inst instructing individual and small groups of students, um, how we're implementing some of those behavior management uh, plans uh, certainly would uh, be a mix of both. Um, preparing those instructional materials. Um, so all of these things really just kind of um, being shared um, across both um, our teachers as well as our paraprofessionals. So hopefully going back and taking a look at your initial um, responses. I'm, I'm curious, do you feel like you pretty much hit, hit the mark um, as we went through these individual roles versus shared roles, or were there some surprises? We were just discussing here at Malvern, and we feel like um, after hearing this is kind of a breath of fresh air, because we do kind of feel like we're doing pretty good in these areas. Obviously, we always have room for improvement. Everybody does, but I think that right now we have an amazing system in place and we feel we feel pretty good about these things. That is awesome. Um, I was just gonna say something and I lost my train of thought. It'll come back to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I Danielle, one of the things um, 
when you said that sometimes it's just like affirming yep we're on the right track or yeah maybe there's some areas that we need to tweak so um, I appreciate that um, that feedback and truly it's always nice to hear what other districts are doing too you know if we can pick up any pointers or things that you know we can work on getting better at here as well so it's just nice to hear that absolutely for sure well, I'm going to pass the baton over to Tiffany. She's going to take us through the rest. Well, and bear with me because I'm still learning the whole Zoom. We always used um, Google. So when I came to state support team, I had to kind of learn a whole new system. All right. Can you see that all right? Perfect. Okay. So I know we're kind of running tight on time. And so in our in the share folder that we gave you guys, um, there is some information about what each category, we want to give you a little bit of special ed background, right? Because everybody has a different um, knowledge, right? A knowledge of how does the whole process work? So under IDA in the state of Ohio, of Ohio, these are categories that children can qualify under. Um, there's 13 categories and we put in some, based on the operating standards, kind of a um, description of each area. Um, so how familiar are you with each disability category? Give you a few minutes to kind of look at the categories. And if you can pop in there, or you can just unmute and tell us how comfortable or how much knowledge you have. So if you are a classroom para, let me, maybe let's put it this way. If you're a classroom paraprofessional and you're helping a teacher in a classroom, do you, do you know what they're like, what I know you track your IEP goals, but do you know maybe what they're identified as, you know, are they a child with autism or they have a learning disability in um, math? So you have that kind of information. That's where Holly and I were kind of curious as how much information is shared? How much do you know um, in regards to disability categories? We're familiar with all of them at our school over the years. Good. Anyone else? All right. Familiar with some, it looks like. Um, information is shared with the paras. Nathan Stokowski to the office. So Valerie, you said um, you have an idea of most of them, but you really struggle with autism spectrum. Do you want to elaborate a little bit? Are you comfortable with sharing? <laughs> okay. All right. So Holly, we can move on to the next slide if you don't mind. So we have, um, kind of walked you there's a handout that's also in your shared file and it kind of walks through um what's required in an IEP and so we got to make sure um an IEP is a legal binding document right and so we, we got to make sure that personal information about the student is on the IEP 
So I'm not going to go into this a lot. You guys can read and kind of go through it because I, I definitely want us to get to confidentiality here in a few minutes. Um, but I want to kind of, this is the process. If you've never been in an IEP meeting um, or seen a whole IEP, this is something um, that should all be included. Holly, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? The biggest thing is that the area of need, um, making sure that the area is identified, the need of the child is being met, uh, and we're collecting the data on that. Anything else on the IEP requirements or IEP team or timelines? Okay. And then if we could go to the 10 basic, um, how I guess before we we go to the one handout that has the 10 basics of special education, Holly. Okay. Um, how familiar are you with the whole process from child find to, is this something that you guys feel like in future sessions that you would like us to like talk about more or you feel pretty comfortable? And this is where Holly and I really need some feedback because we don't want to send, you know, do a bunch of training that is information you already know. So take a look at this document that Holly's pulled up. Um, this is the process of how a child gets identified. A lot of times um, they come to you already identified, but this is the process, the legal process that we have to kind of go through. Um, how many of you are familiar with this, want me to move on, and you know it, and we can just keep on moving? Just let me know. Put it in the chat. I know it. Okay. Anyone else? They're not familiar with all We know what the process is. Okay, but we have one in here. I'm not familiar with the process at all. Maybe we could do just a quick run through. Yeah, that's what I'm we thinking. Know, we know the process, but we're not invited to IEP meetings or, but sometimes the teacher will, you know, ask for our input. Yeah. Thanks. And a lot of times we we're not invited to IEP meetings either, but we do know the process. Okay. okay. So for a child that is not identified yet, and is struggling. There's a whole process, it's called child fight, where we go out and um, start collecting data, provide interventions. Um, but once, you know, let's say a parent suspects a disability, requests the district to do an evaluation on their child, the district has 30 days to respond to their next step. And that next step could be, um, you know, yes, we're going to move forward with testing or no, we don't have enough data. We need to spend some time collecting data from interventions. Um, and then if you move forward with the evaluation, you have 60 days to the district has 60 days to complete that evaluation. So the child's evaluated. And once that evaluation is completed, the IEP team comes together at what's called an ETR meeting to review those results. And as a group, based on the data from that evaluation, the team decides the eligibility category. Those were those 13 categories that the child can um, fall under. Um, and so you either find the child eligible for services or not. And then from there, you schedule an IEP meeting and you have 30 days from the date of the initial ETR, the evaluation, to write an IEP. Um, and I will tell you, you know, I, I've heard it for years, but, you know, Para is really wanting to be at IEP meetings. And to be honest with you from where I was, you know, up until I joined state support team this year, I couldn't spare you. <laughs> I needed you with, with our kids, right? So the teacher could attend. Now I will say I wanted information from you right? I wanted to know. And there were times where maybe um, it's a one-to-one -one aid and we couldn't spare the para coming to the meeting, 
but the paraprofessional provided a ton of data for us. And if I had questions on that or the parents had questions, we would swap out. I'd send somebody to go get our paraprofessional to come in and kind of walk the team through it. So it looks really different in every district, but I will tell you, it was not a practice for me as a director to have my parents there just because I couldn't, I couldn't spare you. <laughs> I needed you. I needed you with the, with them your schedule and, but I always got input. I never wanted to not have the input because you are the front line, right? And you know, inside and out. It's kind of like, sometimes, you know, sometimes I call the bus barn, like what's going on on the bus? Like <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, we would really like everybody that has the child at the meeting, but we can't spare them. So um how does it look in your district as far? So we had several that weighed in that they're not able to go to the IEP meetings. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? All right, looks Holly looks like the the chat's pretty quiet. Right. I know when I was in district um, as a director, sometimes we would have parents request um, the participation of the para pro. So I've had that situation, uh, mm -hmm. but oftentimes our paraprofessionals did not participate either. When I was a one to one, um, the grandparent of my student who was custodial she she did request my presence and and so that I, I did go to those IEP meetings and I will say to Joe um I had like three very medically fragile children and they had full service right so they had a one-on-one -on -one for their medical needs <clears throat> we had gate trainers and you know really involved children um feeding you know feeding tubes and just a uh, a plethora of issues. I would have those health one-to-one -one aids at that meeting. Um, and the student would come with them, obviously. But because a lot of times when we're dealing with high medical needs too, um, you have the nurse at the table and that para that's going to be um, doing some of that. You know, if they've had hip surgery or extension surgery or brain surgery, you know, what does that look like in a school day? And they, they need to be there. Um, so that's, that is when I would normally involve a para um, to our IEPs, just because it is health and um, so, yeah. At Malvern, um, the para pros are certainly welcome to um, join IEP meetings. It's not that they're not invited, um, but they're oftentimes taking place during the day. So those paraprofessionals are busy with that student. Right. Um, we do <laughs> often invite them to transitioning meetings, particularly oh, from yeah. preschool to kindergarten. And we do have a, pre a county preschool house in our building. So um, oftentimes when we have those transitioning meetings, paraprofessionals will cer certainly take part in those. Yeah. And we did the same thing for our kinder preschool to kindergarten transition as well. Um, all right, so we are gonna spend the last bit of time talking about confidentiality. <clears throat> um, we'll come back to the role expectation, but I definitely wanna talk a little bit about, Holly, are you okay with that? If we pop to confidentiality? What, I, I'm gonna start this a little different and ask you to pop it in the chat or you can unmute and talk to us, but do you know about confidentiality and what you can share and not share? So if you can give me some examples of what you can share and what you cannot share. Um, and like I said, you can pop it in the chat or you can just unmute whichever you prefer. But I kind of like to get the skill, like kind of some background of the group. We typically don't share anything because we live in a very small area, so it wouldn't take much for people to be able to identify who we were talking about. Anyone else? I'm 
um, outside of the classroom teacher and possibly the administration, um, not talking about anything outside, you know, outside of the school or like I said, even outside of the classroom, really. And, you know, and we all know that personal, identif you know, that identifiable information um, is anything with the student's name, address, um, family members that is considered that personal information. Um, the Individuals with Disability Act includes confidentiality requirements to protect the privacy of the student's educational records. And I'm sure as part of your either yearly um, review uh, for training, do you guys have to go through a confidentiality training um, either through public school works or um, as part of your required trainings every year, do you have to do a confidentiality training? At Malvern, we do not. You do not, okay. Anyone else? If I remember correctly, our public school works covers that. Okay. Um, and once a child, you know, and it's kind of even doubly, once a child has been referred to, an, you know, for that evaluation um, under IDA, they are protected even further with that confidentiality piece. Um, and every year parents have to sign, like at the IEP meeting, confidentiality um, gets renewed every year. And that's all part of um, IDA. Um, any questions with that? And I, I kind of want to, I mean, I could, let's go to the next screen and talk a little bit about it, Holly. And you can jump in too if I'm, because it sounds like a lot of them are pretty familiar with it. Uh, Valerie put in there. I will say this, and I'm just going to give you a scenario. And I want you to kind of think about it. You know, we know what IDA says and we know like the basics. I do not know how many times confidentiality was breached in my district from the time the child got on the school bus to the child got delivered either at home or at school. And we know that that most buses, right, they have video and, um, but there have been times or instances where I would actually have to review bus video where either a paraprofessional or a school bus driver were talking about a child in front of other children, um, kind of violating, you know, information um, or vice versa. So always thinking, you know, and it's been, let's say it's been a long day. And, it, and you are just, you're up to here, right? We always have to be mindful of who our audience are, who is around. You know, we all have to have that person, right? To go and vent and, and, and talk to, but know who that person is. Does that person have the child at any time, right? Do they have a vested interest or is this just somebody outside um, that does not have the child in class? Um, Make sure you understand your district's policy. Always, always, always know what that policy is for confidentiality. If you have questions, you ask your immediate supervisor. Um, and I always used to say, rule of thumb, if it doesn't feel right, probably isn't right. Uh, but go ask a question. I'd rather you do that than compromise confidentiality. Um, You know, you can access as long as you have that student and you're working directly with the student, you can access the student's file, the individual record, but that can only be done with permission, right? Every district's a little different. Um, I used to keep all of my IEP folders locked up as a teacher. And um, if anybody needed access, like my paras, they, they would ask me, for, to look at the file, um, if it was their, you know, other files within the school, they would have to go through the principal. Um, so again, just make sure you're going through those proper channels 
to access information and that you're authorized to access them. Um, and you can always speak privately with your supervisor about policies and procedures. And if you don't know, ask. Um, any questions there? And I will say, I think sometimes confidentiality, yes, we know, you know, we can't share this, this, and this about, but I think we have to be very mindful of conversations we're having, where we're having those conversations about children and who's hearing, who's our audience. And again, it's hard on some days, right? It's hard, you're exhausted, maybe you've, you've hit that threshold, but um, always be mindful of that. Any, any questions or input there? Holly, did I miss anything there? I think you're good. So I no, yeah, I everybody, I, I must be boring them to death because they're all really super quiet. I, I know confidentiality isn't one of those exciting topics, no, but I think there's probably been opportunities where uh, sometimes straddling <laughs> you know, um, even unintentionally uh, sharing information with maybe folks who really don't need to know that information. And um, sometimes that can be in an uncomfortable position, but sounds like everybody um, has that under their belt in terms of knowing when and what um, is allowed to be shared. So we just wanted, knowing that this was our first session, this is just one of those big ticket items that we wanted to make sure that, um, especially if you're, if you're new, um, we know there's been lots of changes in, um, in staff across all of our districts across the state and um, just can't stress enough the importance of confidentiality and making sure that you understand what your district's policies are, so. The next slide is kind of just summing up. Now, again, this is just a real basic um, what you shouldn't do, right? In every district, it may look a little different, but a paraprofessional doesn't assign those final grades. They don't score or, you know, interpret those assessments. Um, you do not, you know, you do not assume that full responsibility for the student um, for an infinite amount of time. In other words, you, you shouldn't have to watch a child on your own all day long. Um, and and ex you shouldn't have that role put on you. Um, having primary responsibilities for writing an, an IEP. So in other words, um, you would not write, as a paraprofessional, you are not to write an IEP. Um, that, that can not end, you know what I mean? That's just legally, gets mucky, um, for lack of better words, right, Holly? Um, you don't have or should not have to make decisions about the student's educational program without the teacher's approval. Um, you shouldn't teach a class without the teacher present. Um, this is a big one. Um, you should never be left um, to teach a class and the teacher not be present when you're teaching it. <clears throat> Um, you shouldn't attend IEP meetings in place of the teacher. So in other words, you should not go to an IEP meeting if the teacher cannot. They need to assign, and that's all legality, right? That's all legal um, legal processes there. Um, you shouldn't have to report to the student's parents without teacher approval. Now, this kind of give and take, sometimes it's the teacher that calls, sometimes the uh, paraprofessional calls, but there's also situations where sometimes the paraprofessional may shoot a text off to a parent or make a phone call and the teacher doesn't know. Um, I've seen that happen a lot over the years and it really causes a lot of issues. So again, make sure your teacher always knows and approves when you're going to contact parents. Um, you should not be making modifications or adaptations without proper training and or teacher approval. Um, so you definitely need some training and, and modifications of taking some things and modifying, um, again, with the stamp of approval by the teacher. Um, and you should not be supervising any student teachers. So these are like big ones, um, big, 
big things that legally can can get get you into some trouble. Any questions on this slide? So since COVID, there's been a huge shortage of substitute teachers. What do you do in the case that there isn't someone to cover your teacher's class for the day? That's, that's a conversation you need to have with your district. Um, I mean, we, you know, every district is facing that challenge where, um, you know, we, we do have, like, I know in our district, we always, if we had a paraprofessional that also had a degree, we'd make sure they had um, gotten their sub license, right? And so they were able, if the teacher was not present, she at least was a certified sub. The para was a sub. Um, so again, you know, that's something that you would need to discuss with your, your building leadership. Holly, am I missing anything there? No, and I was going to say even, gosh, I'm hearing more and more where administrators are classroom teachers for the day, um, hearing lots of, well, I heard an instance where a superintendent was driving a school bus, you know, <laughs> so it's, that's definitely a theme um, across um, our region and across the state. Um, you know, and I think it's just really about making good decisions, what's, what's best for students and um, kind of what Tiffany referred to in terms of, um, you know, you're kind of under the direction of your, your, your district and, you know, so, yeah, it's, I, I don't know um, what that's going to look like for our future, but I, I, I know it's going to be a, um, not a quick fix, right? Right. Or, or shortage. And just some more kind of leading to that in the chat. Um, you know, is it okay if the teacher leaves plans or in the Google Doc? Again, I just go back to legally um, what happens, right? So legally what happens if a child gets hurt under your watch? Um, that's why, you know, especially in our, our, some of our classrooms, we had several aides on staff or pairs on staff that also had their sub license. So we were able to kind of legally make sure that's taken care of. But I would definitely, Valerie, run that through your building, your building leadership, your district. Any questions, any other input or thoughts? Very welcome, Valerie. So I think we kind of um, skipped over a slide real quick. Do we want to go back to it, Holly, or are we good? Yeah, let's let's take a quick peek. So your you know role expectations when we talk about all things, what we look for in paraprofessionals. Um, we want you taking initiative, being involved in the classroom, being involved in the activity. Uh, be conscientious of the model or example being demonstrated. Um, use positive encouragement with students. Support school rules and goals. Be observant of students during the school day. And I don't know how many times my paras got ahead of a situation before it became a bigger situation because they were observant and plugged into kids. And sometimes it was kids that they didn't even work with. They were just being observant and knowing kids as well as you know children. Sometimes you can be um, a big impact in further escalating issues, right? So definitely continue being observant of those kiddos. Um, be aware of the content, you know, what's being taught. Accept paraprofessional responsibilities. And, you know, again, it looks different in each district, each building. Um, know those responsibilities, what you're expected uh, to do. And if you don't know, you ask your leadership. Express the value, you know, you place on education. So make sure you're sharing and modeling to uh, the students you work with how important education is to you and, and feel free to share it. 
and make sure you're always maintaining and demonstrating loyalty and maintain confidentiality. Sometimes, you know, teachers can be difficult, right? And it's real easy to just be really upset with the teacher. Again, maintain that professionalism, even on the bad days and that loyalty to your district. And if you need to express those concerns, you, you, you do it that way in the proper way. But again, we couldn't do it without our paras. And I know we don't say that, you know, many places don't say that enough. Um, the job you do is hard. Um, it is emotional. Some days are so draining, uh, but we, you know, we couldn't, couldn't do without you. So know your importance in the world of education and in the world of uh, all things kiddos. Right, Holly? Yes. Any questions? So the next thing I want to kind of talk to you guys about is our next session. And Holly, you alluded to this and, and you can surely talk, but um, this is kind of what we are looking at for our next session. Uh, talking about all things documentation, data tracking, uh, individualized supports, medical behavior, what, what is a section 504, specially designed instruction. Um, is this kind of what you're, what do you feel that you would like to learn more about? I think Holly, you mentioned that early, early on in our presentation today. Um, if, if there's something else you would like us we, to when, when we were thinking about this originally, we were thinking if we were in your shoes and knowing what you would be faced with first, <laughs> um, without really knowing our audience, we wanted to lay a good foundation and we knew confidentiality, right? That's one of the big things that, you know, as a, as a new person, if you're new to this role, just understanding um, confidentiality, but those things that perhaps we shouldn't be putting our paraprofessionals in the position of doing. Um, but then these were some of those next big ticket items. We heard earlier about the import, the, the whole idea around discipline. What does that look like? We know that when we talk about behavior, we'll get into a little bit of that. But one of the reasons when we when we think about discipline, especially for our students with disabilities, there's ramifications when you think about different aspects of discipline. Um, and so what discipline means uh, to each um, individual student, you know, are we talking about um, out of school suspension, in school suspension, they're being sent to the office, is that considered to be you know, removal of services. And, you know, so there's big implications for that. Um, and, yep. So um, some of that will be covered then, um, but we'll, we'll spend some time. Um, these were kind of, like I said, those big ticket items that we were thinking of next. And then in session. Oh, some great things in the chat, Holly, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt okay. you. Uh, data tracking. Yes. Um, so we're on track there. Awesome. Section we're, 504. Yep. We're, we have an evaluation that we're going to ask for you to complete. And I'm going to jump out of here to grab the direct link to put in the chat. It would be extremely helpful if you could um, complete the evaluation. And then after you see the evaluation link, I'll drop in the link for your certificate. So I'm going to put this here. So that should be your evaluation if you couldn't get it from the PowerPoint. And then if you'll take just a moment to go ahead and fill that out. And definitely um, put in that evaluation some things you would like to learn more about that will help Holly and I as we start to structure the rest of the sessions. Right, Holly? Yes, or even thinking about how much time we will devote to some of the topics that um, we think um, are important here. And I really enjoyed the, um, the discussions around that 
the breakout activities and just, um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed hearing from you and, and getting that kind of a feedback, so. Um, we're gonna put as well, um, you'll see on the very last slide, our contact information. I'm gonna pop, um, and then if, um, Thinking about social media, if you want to follow us, there's kind of our information, Twitter and Facebook. And then lastly, here is our contact information. And again, if you've heard some things today that you want to follow up with your director or your um, supervisors, um, please feel free to do so and share this information. We'll be sending out um, the recordings and the um, materials. We appreciate your patience as we navigated the technology and getting you into uh, breakout rooms, but we sure enjoyed um, being here with you today. Mm -hmm.